Welcome to EPG Patsala. I am SK Acharya from Ravensa University, Katak. Today we shall discuss about the Hatigumpa inscription of Kharabelo, module of the paper Indian culture. The main objective of this module is to study of history and decipherment of Hatigumpa inscription, about the language, script and content of the inscription and also about the political, social, economic, religious and cultural achievements of King Kharabelo as gleaned from the inscription. Now, this inscription is the most important record regarding the history and achievements of King Kharabelo. Other inscriptions belonging to his chief queen, son and grandson as well as some high officials are found engraved in many caves of the Udegiri hill. Udegiri hill is one of the twin hillocks near Bhuvaneswar which formed an important seat of Jainism in ancient period. The other hillock is called as Khandagiri. These are the twin hills and the caves which are found in these slides. The inscription, Hatigampa inscription is called the elephant cave inscription. It is engraved on the ceiling of the cave. It is heavily damaged and some of the letters are completely defaced. And it, the inscription contains 17 lines of writing. You can see the slide. The letters are defaced and how the lines are rubbed off. This inscription was first discovered by A. Starling in 1820 and it was copied by Colonel Mackenzie. But credit goes to James Princip who succeeded for the first time in deciphering this inscription from a fresh facsimile prepared by Lieutenant Kito in 1837 and the result was published uh, in the journal of the Ascetic Society of Bengal. This slide shows the 17 lines of writing. This is an eye copy of the inscription and how the inscription is badly damaged at many places. One important fact about the inscription is that it has drawn attention of many scholars and has been re-edited several times. In the 19th century, several, several scholars like Alexander Cunningham, Bhagwan Lal Indraji, Rajendra Lal Mitra, J. F. Fleet, George Buller and others edited this inscription and offered their respective views and opinions. In the 20th century, the inscription was again revisited by epigraphists like Steno, Luders, Adi Banerjee, K. P. Jaiswal, V. M. Barwa, D. C. Sarkar and others. Now coming to the importance of the record, we find that it contains the detailed account of Kharabalo from his childhood to the 13th year of his reign in perfect chronological order. No epigraphical record so far discovered in India maintains such chronological sequence about a ruler and his achievements. Besides, it refers to a number of kings and dynasties of both earlier and contemporary period which throw lights on the history of early India. And this inscription is also the earliest inscription of India which that refers to Bharatabarsha and Uttarapatha. It also mentions many places of importance such as Gurothagiri, Rajagriya, Mathura, Pithunda and so on. It also talks us about the kingdoms like Anga and Magadha and also the Tamil kingdoms. The composer of had a remarkable sense of history, topography and chronology of India during that time. In a sense, the record has often been christened as an eulogy of the king because the career and achievement of the king uh, has been eulogized by the composer. Now coming to the language and script of the inscription, we know that the language of the inscription is generally considered as Prakrit, but it is distinct type of Prakrit or Magadhi Prakrit that was current in Magadha. It is also different from the language used in the rock edits of Asoko found in Odisha. You know that uh, the rock edits of Asoko are found in Dhauli and Jaugad, the two places in Odisha. So the language of Dhauli Jaugad edicts uh, are completely different from the language of Hatigampa inscription. K. P. Jaiswal and Adi Banerjee inclined to believe that the language of the inscription is not Magadi and it has some resemblance with the canonical Pali. In fact, Prakrit had a number of variants in India such as Magadi, Ardha Magadi, Surasini, Maharashtri, etc. And the language of the inscription may therefore be called as Odra Prakrit which had some near approach to the canonical Prakrit. One of the finest compositions in the epigraphic literature of India 
this inscription is one of the finest compositions in the epigraphic literature of India and most of the verbs are found in the present indicative and present causative forms and the frequent occurrence of present tense indicates that Kharabala was ruling over Kalinga at the time of the composition and engraving of the inscription. It exhibits the excellence of poetic quality and retains the ornate and expressive prose style. The script is admittedly Brahmi and exhibits a stage of development after Asokan Brahmi. So, it is different from Maurjan Brahmi, it is more advanced than the Maurjan Brahmi or Asokan Brahmi and it can be called as the transitional Brahmi. Now, coming to the date of Kharavala, this is the most uh, controversial uh, topic made by the scholars who have edited and re-edited the inscription. Now, about the date of Kharavala, the inscription furnishes the names of four important rulers of ancient India in connection with the activities and achievements of Kharavala. First of all, we get an idea about or the reference about Satakarni who was a Satavahana king. Then, uh, 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 the inscription also tells us about one Nandaraja. He has been identified with Mahapadmananda, the king of Magadha. And the inscription also tells us about uh, one Javanaraja, he was a foreigner. And uh, it also refers to Brihaspati Mitra, the king of Magadha, a contemporary of Kharavala. Besides, the expression Tivasa Sata showing the time gap of 300 years between Nandaraja and Kharavala. Tivasa Sata has been variously interpreted by scholars. Some scholars point out it is 103 years, some other scholars believe that it is 300 years. Now, we come to the conclusion that uh, this is actually 300 years, Three, Tivasa Sata may be interpreted as 300 years, that is the gap between Nandaraja and Kharavala, Mahabadanada ruled in the 4th century BC and Kharavala ruled 300 years after him. So, uh, convincingly, uh, the inscription can be placed in the 1st century BC. Now, regarding the ancestry and early career of the king, the inscription gives a fairly detailed account. Kharavala belonged to the third generation of Chedi Mahamegavana dynasty of Kalinga. Mahamegavana was the progenitor of the family and he was very likely the grandfather of Kharavala. Chetaraja was the immediate predecessor of Kharavala and he was very likely his father. The inscription states that Kharavala was a young prince as a young prince was physically handsome and was brown complexioned. In his childhood, he received proper training in the field of writing, coinage, accountancy, legal and administrative procedures. The inscription states that he was competent in lekha, rupa, ganana, bevahara, vidhi. Lekha means writing, rupa means coinage, ganana means accountancy, bevahara means legal and vidhi means administrative rules and regulations or procedures. Now, the king had also obtained proficiency in the art of dancing and music and also military techniques. While going through the slides uh, of the capes uh, and the sculptural embellishments in the capes, we shall get an idea about the dancing and music and also the military techniques. He assumed the responsibility of administration as a crown prince at the age of 15. For about 9 years, he remained in that charge and he was anointed as the king of Kalinga after the completion of 24th year. He had the title of Aira Maharaja, which denotes that he was an Aryan king and he was also uh, considered or called in the inscription as Kalinga Dipati, that is Lord of Kalinga. Now, Kharavala uh, was a benevolent king and this is clear from his inscription. In the very first year of his reign, he repaired the gates, ramparts, structures of Kalinga Nagari that is, that was his capital. Kalinga Nagari was the capital of, uh, of uh, Kharavala and it was severely damaged in the first regnal year or prior to the first regnal year of the king. That is why he repaired all the monuments that was located in Kalinga Nagari, the, the capital. And Kalinga Nagari has been identified by many scholars with modern Sisupalgad, which is very close to Bhuvaneswar. And it was excavated by ASI, Archaeological Survey of India in 1948-49. Baby Lal was in charge of the excavation. And this uh, site was also excavated later on by uh, Monika Smith and uh, Ravi Mahanti um, 10 years back. Uh, a fortified citadel with a huge mud rampart has been discovered from this site. 
and the site also uh, yielded a number of antiquities like uh, punch mart coins, rolleted wares, um, terracotta objects, iron implements and many more. Uh, Kharavala had built a uh, flight of states, steps for the cool tank, Sitolo Tadago, that is the expression mentioned in the inscription and he laid out all gardens at the cost of 3500,000 coins and thus pleased his subjects. So, in the very first year of his reign, Kharavalo uh, proved himself to be a good and benevolent king. Now, in the third regnal year, he made arrangements of festivals and gatherings and organized performances in acrobatics, dance and music. All these are all evident from the sculptural embellishments uh, in the numerous caves in Khandagiri and Udagiri hills. And Kharavalo uh, was accompanied by his queens and courtiers while watching or witnessing the uh, performances. This indicates that king was a great pattern of dance and music. These are the slides which show that the king was witnessing the dancing performances, the musical concerts and also the military um, exhibitions made by the people of Kalinga uh, in the capital city of Kalinga Nagari. In the fifth regnal year of the king, he had renovated the aqueduct that is the canal that had been originally excavated some 300 years before by Nandaraja Mahapadvananda and extended its, its flow up to Kalinga Nagari. From the excavation at Sisupalgad, archaeologists could trace the evidence of a moat surrounding the fortified area. So, there is a complete corroboration of uh, the inscriptional matter and the archaeological findings and uh, this strengthens the identification of Kalinga Nagari with Sisupalgad, modern Sisupalgad. The benevolence of the king is further attested to by the act of remitting taxes and cesses for both the urban and rural population of his kingdom. There is an expression known as uh, Pauro Janapada. So, Kharavala had remitted the taxes from both from the urban and rural people. Kharavala was also a great conqueror. He was a military genius and the political prevailing political situation demanded military preparedness on the part of the king because during that time the Satabhanas were rising in the Deccan and they were holding sway over um, the modern territories of Andhra Pradesh, Telangana and Maharashtra states. And uh, uh, in Magadha, Brihaspati Mitra was also uh, rising uh, as a powerful ruler and the Indo-Greeks were also threatening the integrity of India uh, and they were uh, dominating the northern and northwestern part of India. And in the extreme south, there was a confederacy of the Tamil states and the southern states like Cheros, Cholas, Pandyas, Satraput, Satyaputras and Keraliputras, they were combined together to uh, meet any challenges from the north. In these circumstances, the young and ambitious king Karavala launched a career of conquests and reorganized the military strength of the kingdom. Now, uh, Karavala had organized and reorganized his army and it was a vast army. Line 4 of the inscription points out that uh, he had a vast army under his command and it consisted of infantry, cavalry, elephantry and chariots. Infantry means Naro. Uh, cavalry means Hayo, elephantry means Gajo and chariot means Ratha. So, all the uh, fourfold division of army was under the command of the king. From line 17 it is known that he assumed the pride, proud epithet of Apratihata Chakabahana Bala or the position of a large or a huge in, and invincible army. Now, uh, after reorganizing his army, Kharabalo uh, set out uh, his conquests in different directions. First of all, in the second regnal year, Karabalo, disregarding Satakarni, mobilized his vast army to the west and marched up to the river Krishna and stormed the city of Asika. In the fourth regnal year, Karabalo again directed his army to march against the Satavahana territory. This time, he took the assistance of the resources of Vidyadhara territory, which was then considered as invincible. The rulers of Rastrikas and Bhojakas were crushed their crowns were cast off, their umbrellas and other royal insignia were thrown aside 
and their jewellery and wealth confiscated and they were made to pay obeisance to the king of Kalinga. The discomfiture of the kings of Rastikas and Bhojakas made Kalinga a great power and its sphere of influence extended from eastern sea to the western sea. Kharavala, uh, in, the first, in, the first, in his first campaign against the Satavahanas and his second campaign against the Rastikas and Bhojakas had almost uh, uh, made a complete control over the territories in the western part of Kalinga. Now, his next mil military expedition was directed against the kingdom of Mag Magadha because you know that uh, the king of Asoka, the king of Magadha had invaded Kalinga in 261 BC and Kharavala wanted to take revenge against him and that's why he prepared his military ability or military uh, forces and in his 8th uh, regional year, he marched to the north, demolished the fortress of Gorothagiri guarding Rajagriha. Gorothagiri has been identified with uh, the Barabar hills and Rajagriha is the same as Pataliputra. So, Pataliputra was guarded by Gorothagiri, the hill fort of Barabar. Now, at this critical juncture, the Indo-Greeks who had already taken position of Mathura advanced towards Pataliputra. Kharavala diverted his plan of besieging Rajagriha, that is Pataliputra, and chastised the Javanas up to Mathura drove them from there and saved the cities of Mathura, which was then a famous stronghold of Jainism. So, Kharavala chastised the Javanas up to Mathura and saved the city of uh, Mathura from the Javanas. In order to commemorate his victory against the Javanas, in the very next year, that is in the ninth regnal year, uh, he constructed a huge victory palace, Mahabijaya Prasada in Kalinganagari by spending 3,800,000 coins. In the 10th regnal year, Kharavala again marched towards Bharatabarsa for the for conquest. This is the first epigraphic reference to Bharatabarsa which probably denoted North India in general. No details about the campaign have been mentioned in the record except that the king secured jewels and precious stones from the retreating army. It seems that the retreating army referred to in the record could be the Indo-Greeks. So, there is no detailed account of the fight in the 10th regnal year. In the 11th regnal year, Kharavala fought a war with the forces of confederated Tamil states including the Cheros, Cholas, Pandyas, Satyaputras and Keraliputras. Possibly there was a confederacy of all these Tamil states and Kharavala wanted to break the confederation in his 11th regnal year. And in the 13th regnal year, Kharavala uh, lost his uh, strange and wonderful elephants and ships, but obtained horses and elephants and jewellery. The reference to loss of ships in the battle apparently point to a naval battle. Kharavala was evidently having a navy under his command. In the 12th regnal year, Kharavala proceeded with a vast army as far as, as, as Uttarapatha, that is the northwestern part of India, where he terrorized many kings to submission. Although inscription is silent on kings and kingdoms subdued by the king, yet it, it appears that the Indo-Greeks were compelled to submission. On his return to Uttarapatha, he planned to invade Magadha and encamped on the banks of the river Ganges. People of Magadha were struck te terrified at the sight of the vast army of Kalinga. Brihaspati Mitra was then the ruler of Anga and Magadha and uh, he could not offer any resistance and he was forced to surrender. After the defeat and surrender of the Magadhan ruler, Kharavala brought back to Kalinga, the Kalinga Jina, that is the trophy of victory. Kharavala uh, brought this Kalinga Jina, which was taken away by Nandaraja in 4th century BC. Thus, within a very brief span of 10 years, Kharavala could achieve a series of victories, extending his sovereignty from the northwestern part of India to South India. The army of Kalinga, under his command, marched through the territories of Satabanas. They subdued the Rastikas and Vojakas, they chastised the Javanas, they terrorized the people of Magadha and destroyed the confederacy of the Tamil states. These military exploits did not aim at establishing a political empire. This is most important that Kharavala didn't mean to uh, establish a political empire of Kalinga engulfing all the conquered territories but to exhibit the power and prestige of Kalinga by humbling the rising powers of, the of his time. In this respect, he fully justified the claim of the title Chakrabartin given to him in the inscription of his chief queen. Kharavala was a great patron of Jainism. 
अनलाइक अशोक वो आज ए कन्वर्ट टू बुद्धिजिम खार बेल वो आज ए जैन बाय फेथ द ओपनिंग लाइन्स अफ हाथी गुम्फा इन्सक्रिप्शन क्लियरली रीड्स नमो अर्हता नाम नमो सब्ब सिद्धा नाम सैल्यूटिंग द अर्थ्स एंड ऑल द सिद्धर्स हिज मिलिटरी कैंपेन्स वेर ऑफ एंड लिंक्ड विथ हिज रिलीजियस झील फॉर हाइटेनिंग द प्रेस्टीज ऑफ द जैन ऑफ फेथ इन हिज एट टेंटल इयर हि रेस्क्यूड मथुरा द फेमस पिलग्रीम सेंटर ऑफ जैनिजिम फ्रॉम द जवानस एंड ब्रॉट फ्रॉम देयर ए सेप्लिंग ऑफ द कल्प ट्री विथ ए सेरिमोनियस मिलिटरी प्रोसेशन टू कलिंग इन द इलेवेंथ रेग्नल इयर खारवल इज सेट टू हैव रिक्लेम्ड द एनशियन सिटी ऑफ पिथुंड बाय प्लोज ड्रॉन बाय आसेस द रिक्लेमेशन ऑफ द सिटी बाय द यूज ऑफ आसेस इन प्लेस ऑफ बोल्स इंडिकेट्स दैट द किंग वाज ए डिवोटी ऑफ फर्स्ट तीर्थंकर आदिनाथ ऋषभनाथ आदिजीन ऋषभनाथ आफ्टर डिफीटिंग द किंग ऑफ मगध खारवल ब्रॉट बैक द कलिंग जीन टू कलिंग इट वॉज टेकन अवे बाय महापद्मानंद सम थ्री हंड्रेड इयर्स बैक एज वी हैव ऑलरेडी पॉइंटेड आउट द किंग इज ऑल्सो कॉल्ड एज एन उपासक और ए डिभोटी ऑफ स्वतंबर सिस्टम एंड बेस्टउड रॉयल एंडोमेंट्स टू द मंग्स ऑफ दैट सेक्ट फॉर द रेनी सीजन रिट्रीट्स ऑफ द जैन मंग्स द किंग हैड डिस्कबेटेड ए नंबर ऑफ सेल्स और केव्स फॉर रेस्टिंग ऑफ देयर बॉडीज इन द उदयगिरी हिल्स ऑफिसर्स एंड नोबल मैन ऑफ द टाइम ऑफ खारवेलो एज वेल एज द ही चीफ क्वीन एंड सन इम्यूलेटेड द एग्जाम्पल सेट बाय हिम and extended patronage to jainism by excavating caves and making endowments to the monks and shramanas he had equal respect and honor for all the religious sects now we shall come to the ideals of kingship the inscription of kharabelo does not explicitly refer to the pattern of administration but uh, he seems to have emulated the ideals of kingship as envisaged by kautilya in his arthashastra he had studied all branches of knowledge required for a king In line ten of the inscription, he is represented as an embodiment of the principles of politics, diplomacy, peace, and equity. And the expression in the inscription is "Danda Sandhi Samaya." He assumed the title of Aryan Maharaja, that can be translated as the King of the Aryan Race. The coronation of the king is compared with that of Prithu, the son of Bhinya, and he was also a benevolent king who pleased his subjects by remitting taxes by. Uh, organizing festivals festivities by erecting monuments and also by repairing the monuments he turned the life of a rajasri and declared himself the worshipper of rajasri basu in the last line of the inscription he is described as an upholder of law protector of law and executor of law the manchapuri cave inscription of kharwal is called as chakravartin or an all powerful king the inscription further Uh, reveals at many places that he had under his command an invincible army consisting of infantry cavalry elephantry chariots and navy the king possessed an invincible army and this is known from the expressions like mahati sena sena vahini and apradhyata chakravahini bala the offensive strategy of the king to exhibit the military might of the kalinga is manifest in the number of campaigns which he had successfully undertaken in different directions from the building activities initiated by the ruler either in the renovation of canals repairs of devastated township of kalinganagari excavation of caves and erection of dwelling houses in twin hills maintenance of a huge armed force or the construction of a beautiful victory palace in his capital city it is apparent that he had used the state resources for all these accomplishments the state treasury was replenished by revenues collected from different sources the war booty and gifts in the form of coins pearls jewels and precious stones from the subdued rulers and subordinates also added to the treasury the financial stability of the kingdom which father attested to by the remittances of taxes from the general public living in both uh, rural and urban areas in short as uh, kalinga was a prosperous kingdom under kharavala although nothing is known about the administrative system of kalinga under kharavala yet the short commemorative inscriptions in the numerous caves of Udaygiri bear ample testimony to the well organized administrative system under Kharavala. Now we shall come to the summary of the inscription. The inscription offers a fairly good idea about the career and achievements of the king. It reflects the political religious climate of Kalinga and the whole of India. In the post Maurya period the kingdom of Kalinga reasserted its independence under the Mahamegavahanas and attempted to avenge the defeat and discomfiture of against Magadha. 
the text of the inscription for the supplements the process of state formation in Kalinga in the post Maurya phase. The primary state of Magadha had cast its impact on Kalinga. Its subsequent interaction with the pristine state supplied necessary ideas and idioms for the development of a state apparatus with all its essential elements. Thank you.